Uh, it is a great privilege uh, to be opening this meeting along with Chiara. And I uh, know many who participated on this project, both from Slovak and OECD side of our partnership. Uh, and it also makes me happy so, uh, to see here the usual suspects of the behavior crowd, such as Chiara. And uh, I'm eager to meet those of you uh, who I st still don't know personally. And this project is very dear to me. Uh, because it's this at uh, the intersection of two areas uh, that are my bread and butter. Uh, first is public integrity, and uh, second is human behavior. And I spent my uh, days in civil service council pottering around and trying to see how can we nudge here and there to impact the public system, uh, which serves and influences millions of people in their daily lives. And I enjoyed tremendously how the report's findings uh, go in the line, what we have found in our research. Uh, for example, that the Slovak civil servants tend to be more sensitive about the message from their leadership. This was the project of the second um, department, the Corruption Prevention Department, but I hope this project is not the last one. And we will see more work in this area in the future. And I wish you all an excellent and inspiring afternoon. We today have joined forces from Indigo and ASIC, so two different parts of OECD, the behavioral experts and the anti-corruption experts, uh, to present to you this study. So I'm going to start by handing the floor to Laura Volker, who is a policy analyst in the anti-corruption and integrity division of the OECD. And uh, later we will hear also from Laura Cordova Reyes, who is also a junior policy analyst in the same anti-corruption team. And we will also hear from Herietta Blom, who has been really instrumental as a project consultant for the behavioral science team. So Laura, the floor is yours to introduce the project. Thank you so much, uh, Francesca, and uh, delighted to be here with you um, today. Uh, perhaps before we, we launch into the findings of the report, I thought it might be useful to just put this work into context of the, of the project uh, under which it was conducted. So. Um, over the course of four years, we had uh, the pleasure of working with Slovak institutions, first and foremost, the, anti the Corruption Prevention Department and the Government Office, but also many others, um, to work uh, on improving capa capacities in the Slovak pub public administration to uh, reinforce integrity. And so um, this project that we carried out uh, really consisted of a mix of several pieces of analytical work, but we also very much worked with um, civil servants to uh, improve capacities to, uh, to implement integrity measures and developed a number of uh, really concrete tools to help them in, in these efforts. And so um, we did so across uh, four project areas um, First, uh, we focused on incorporating a strategic approach to uh, inform integrity policies. This mainly uh, took place under the framework um, of the former national anti-corruption policy of the Slovak Republic. We also worked with uh, different stakeholders on improving horizontal coordination um, across integrity functions in order to implement uh, that strategic approach. And um, we, uh, we um, explored with Slovak stakeholders on how to engage the whole of society in integrity efforts in order to ensure fit for purpose integrity reforms. And then finally, and this is where this work fits under, we um, uh, worked on applying a behavioral risk-based approach to corruption prevention. Now, why is this important? It is important because um, identifying the most relevant and most um, pressing risks in, in public institutions then allows us to mitigate those risks and really make uh, corruption prevention the most effective, but also to strengthen um, accountability of, of civil servants. And so um, one of the, the other pieces of work under this project that very much provided the basis across the work um, that we conducted under the project 
um, was the Integrity Review of the Slovak Republic that was um, published in 2022, that took a look um, across all these different areas and really presents a 360 view of the Slovak integrity system. Um, and one of the findings, for instance, that this further work builds on was around corruption risk management. And here, the review found that while the Slovak Republic had undertaken uh, a number of measures or had put in place a number of measures in order to um, strengthen corruption risk management, for example, through uh, specific methodological guidelines, that the application of those frameworks and those measures was still somewhat lagging behind. And I should say here that this really is a, a challenge that is not unique to the Slovak Republic, right? Um, it is, uh, as we found, for example, in our recent uh, anti-corruption and integrity outlook, um, really one that is shared across many OECD countries. And so this, uh, the outlook found, for example, um, based on our based on our most recent data that while most OECD countries do have corruption risk management frameworks in place, a lot of them uh, struggle with applying those frameworks in practice in a very consistent and coherent manner. And so this is why we were really excited that um, our Slovak partners were um, excited themselves about uh, getting uh, involved in this specific piece of work and to explore innovative ways of, of improving corruption risk management practice, including by applying behavioral insights. And we're really happy to launch this report today. On the one hand, of course, um, as Chiara already mentioned, because we think it is a very inspiring product as such, and will hopefully be helpful to Slovak institutions in improving their uh, efforts to um, strengthen corruption risk management but also um, because we think that it can be inspiring to a lot of other OECD and non-OECD countries that face similar challenges in that area. So I'd just like to thank again um, our Slovak partners really wholeheartedly for engaging in this work um, and uh, the EA grants for supporting this work. And I'll hand it over to Laura for, uh, for more on integrity and uh, behavioral insights. Thank you, Laura, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, next slide, please. Well, all this specific work that uh, Laura presented as part of the project with the Slovak Republic has been conducted based on the OECD recommendation on public integrity, as well as other recommendations in the integrity area, such as the recommendation on conflicts of interest and the recommendation on lobbying. But let me focus on this one on the recommendation of public integrity. So this recommendation was launched in 2017 and it provides policymakers with a sustainable and a specific approach to fighting corruption as it uh, shifts the focus from ad hoc integrity policies to, as you can see, a context dependent behavioral risk based approach to public integrity. Uh, in addition to this, uh, this recommendation also emphasizes the need of cultivating a culture of integrity. Uh, in the in the in the across the whole of society, which means not only taking into consideration the public servants, but also considering that businesses, uh, civil society organizations, and citizens play a role in cultivating a culture of integrity. But let me focus particularly on this behavior approach. So basically, uh, what the, what the recommendation does is to invite policymakers to apply behavioral insights uh, in policy making for. In, in, in the case of the anti-corruption and integrity field. So it invites policymakers to take one step back and instead of assuming or making assumptions, it invites them to actually analyze and observe what is happening, what are the real behavior behaviors before conducting or implementing a policy at a larger scale. Um, basically what you see on the right side of the, of the slide is our third report on behavioral insights for public integrity this report was launched in 2018, and if you're interested in getting more information about it, please scan the QR code. Uh, this report um, was the main report of a list of reports that you'll see in a minute, and it reviews different uh, conclusions or uh, inputs from behavioral sciences and provides specific lessons on, in the public integrity field. Next slide, please. 
basically why it's behavioral insights important for anti-corruption and integrity measures. So uh, BI for integrity policy, uh, we, see it, we see it as it has uh, important implications in two policy areas. First of all, in supporting ethical choices. So here, uh, we usually make assumptions on how people behave when they are faced to a potential act of corruption. And we tend to think that people will always uh, act or very often will act in a corrupt way if the benefits of this unethical practice are above the costs of this particular integrity, uh, um, unethical uh, practice. But in fact, this is not how it happens and this is not what the experimental ethical uh, research shows. In fact, what we have seen is that more pe most of the people have a moral compass that guides what they do, uh, even when no one's watching, and that most of these people will try to act with integrity based on this uh, moral compass that they have. But sometimes, even with having this internal moral compass, they manage to act in a non-ethical way, but still find the justification for feeling that they are still honest and, on, and generally a moral person. So this has huge implications for policy making. First of all, uh, because traditional anti-corruption measures focus on the corrupt people or the corrupt individuals. And this has a lot of costs on the different procedures and the different people. It also focuses on sanctions and reduces uh, discretion by public officials. But instead, if we focus on what the research shows, that most of the people act with integrity and follow this internal moral compass, we will see that it is not okay to focus exclusively on the corrupt people, but we should also try to empower most of public officials, those who are interested in always working and behaving in a correct way, but sometimes may find a way to justify their non-ethical actions. Uh, as such, we should empower those public officials and we should enable an environment that supports uh, ethical choices or what we call in the integrity uh, division, an open culture of, uh, an open culture, uh, of integrity in the organization. So basically, allow for an, for an environment in which public officials feel, feel, feel free and comfortable of discussing their ethical concerns and their ethical choices. The second big area of uh, potential application of BI, it's uh, ensuring effective implementation of strategy of integrity policy. Basically here, we also tend to assume how integrity policies will be implemented, but we sometimes forget about what really happens when we implement a policy. So when we talk about integrity policies, we talk about all these fields that are included in the slide. So I must read the corruption risk management, uh, internal and external audit, uh, managing conflicts of interest, communication on integrity and anti-corruption. So that's why we talk, uh, that's what we refer to when we talk about integrity policies and anti-corruption policies. Uh, so even in the case of those anti-corruption policies that are well-intentioned, they sometimes do not allow us to achieve the impact that we desired or can even backfire. And this is because we are not considering the real um, consequences and the real behavior of uh, public officials when we implement them. Next slide, please. And I, as I was mentioning, since the 2018 report, we have conducted some work on applying behavioral insights for public integrity. And we have worked on, for instance, um, be, uh, corruption risk management, audit reports, and leadership. And the slide is a bit small, but we have worked with different countries, so Brazil, uh, Romania, um, Chile, and of course, the Slovak Republic. And as Chiara was mentioning, one of the uh, most interesting things of this project, and that Francesca will talk a bit more about, it's that uh, we produced for the first time experimental uh, evidence in this specific project. And as I mentioned, Francesca will uh, talk a bit more about this. And just to conclude, um, BI for public integrity is an area that is still growing. And actually, OECD member countries have shown a lot of interest in this particular area. So you will for sure see more about our work in the coming years. Thank you so much, Laura. And um, <clears throat> we will now turn to present to you a little bit more about these experiments that we conducted. And as was mentioned, the big question that lies at the heart of the experiment is 
how do we prevent corruption in the Slovak public administration? And specifically, we were interested in the question, how do we make sure that public sector employees are empowered to detect corruption risks and that they feel safe to speak out about them? And so to start with this question, of course, we had to diagnose what are some of the behaviors that somehow make it possible that people don't speak up about corruption risks. And we'll talk more about this in a second, but I want to first present to you what is the methodology, what is the process that we follow in this event, as well as other similar projects. So our key point of reference is the so-called basic framework. This is a framework on applied behavioral insights that was developed by the OECD back in 2019. And so we might say this is not our first rodeo at testing it, but uh, the way it works is it's a five-step process for applied behavioral science. It starts with B, behavior. So understanding what is the behavior we're trying to change and also determining is it something that can be changed through behavioral science or is a structural approach a more suited one for the behavior at hand. Then we moved into the analysis and this is kind of looking at why does this behavior take place? What is the context in which it takes place? What are the social norms around it? What do most people think about this behavior? And we then move into the strategy. So based on the analysis, identifying what are the behavioral strategies that we can put in place such that we will counter those biases that we have identified during the analysis phase. On the basis of the strategies, we then implement the intervention. This is a key part and a, a key also value added of behavioral uh, projects, which is this fact of testing things empirically, testing things in practice and, and learning what works and what doesn't. And then we move to the C phase, the change phase of a behavioral project, which is when we scale things up and ideally we learn from it and, and create lasting change. And so now we're going to walk you through how did this basic framework, um, what, what did it look like in this Slovak project? And so the starting point is, of course, identifying which behaviors do we want to target in terms of behaviors that can help us in preventing anti-corruption. And broadly speaking, there were four kinds of behavior that we identified in conversation with anti-corruption coordinators in Slovakia, as well as a number of public officials from different ministries that we interviewed. Uh, we conducted a series of focus groups and interviews and some recurring themes came up. So one of these was that managers in public sectors were displaying kind of a ticking the box behavior. So they were formally ticking the boxes in terms of what they should have been doing. But then in practice, they were not really acting in line with the code of conduct of the public sector. So this was one area of behaviors that came up a lot in interviews. The second one was misreporting. And this was more specific to the National Recovery and Resilience Plan. And the fact that in order to abide to the obligations at the European level, managers tended to misreport their progress and to report that they had been doing things that in practice they hadn't uh, progressed on as much. Another area of behaviors was that of an electronic survey that exists in the Slovak public administration that was introduced such that public sector employees would have a channel to report corruption risks. However, the problem with this is that managers were not really being vocal about encouraging the use of this electronic survey and employees are, were not using it as much as we hoped they would. And related to this was more in general, the key area that we have identified, which is that uh, employees were not speaking up about corruption risks. And there was really a culture of fear, a culture of silence that was preventing the employees to speak up when they saw a potential corruption risks. And I wanna emphasize this potential corruption risk because something that we saw a lot in the interviews was that public officials are aware that they should speak up when they see a corruption incident. So if they see a form of, let's say, corrupt hiring practice that takes place, uh, they are aware that they should speak up. But the line is more blurred when it comes to potential corruption risks. So for example, you're a public employee and you see a 
potential corruption case. You see a hiring practice as maybe it's not okay, maybe it is. And when you don't know, it's more uncertain for you that you should speak up. And so this is um, a takeaway that came up over and over again in the interviews and that we decided to look more closely into. Why did we choose to focus on risk reporting? Well, the narrowing down was a process uh, that followed the, the, the following reasoning. So for the tick in the box uh, behavior, this is very hard to measure through an experiment. For the Smith's reporting, what we noticed is that because it was very linked in the time of the project to the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, it would only apply to certain agencies, but it was not kind of a transversal process that engaged all the administrations. And lastly, in terms of um, developing an intervention on the electronic survey, we didn't prioritize that uh, because it was still under development at the time. So our focus in the end narrowed down to focusing on how do we get employees to speak up about corruption risks. And the first thing that we do following the basic framework that we just presented is trying to understand what are the drivers of these behaviors? Why are people not speaking up? And if we look at the next slide, what we see is, on the one hand, a picture of the focus groups that we uh, presented, just on the next slide. Yeah, there it is. So this, in the picture, you can see Chiara with a number of public officials in Slovakia back in September 2022. So of course, this is the very start of the project when we start getting inputs. And what we see is that there's a number of reasons why employees are not speaking up. And I can say some of the main ones are um, a lack of leadership, of good examples from leaders. So leaders are themselves managers not speaking up about corruption risks. And that is a key reason why uh, employees themselves don't feel safe speaking up. But also there's a limited understanding of the channels to do so. So perhaps employees are aware of corruption risks, but they don't really know how to speak up about them, even though such channels exist. So we mentioned before, there's a, an, an electronic survey through which they could report it, they could speak with their managers, but they're not really aware of these channels that do exist. And either way, they're not really using it. And part of it is the psychological uh, costs of it that, that we highlight so much in behavioral sciences. So the fact of the perception of speaking up. So maybe I do speak up, but there will be retaliation. Um, and so risks such as this prevent people from feeling safe in speaking up. And the fact of not having the good example from leaders is also a factor, uh, as well as lack of awareness of the channels to do so, or lack of easy channels to do so. And here you can see some more pictures of the focus groups and some of the findings. So uh, part of it was like also, as we just mentioned, um, a, a bad example for managers who maybe downplay risks or don't give feedback when an employee raises a corruption risk. So let's say a uh, an employee speaks out about a corruption risk or maybe inputs it through the electronic survey, then we don't have a feedback mechanism that tells the employee, hey, we hear you, we hear that you have reported this corruption risk and this is what we're going to do about it. At the time of the experiment, such feedback mechanism didn't really exist. So people felt that, yeah, maybe I can speak up about the corruption risk, but what's going to happen next? Uh, it's not really clear to me how that is going to be taken into action going forward. And here you can see an overview of these different barriers that we identified. And as we said, there was the fear of speaking up. There was a lack of anonymity in the channel and not having uh, a feedback loop. And so on the basis of these barriers, we then decided to uh, conduct an experiment. And uh, you can here see some of the, of the summary of the barriers that we were trying to focus on. And specifically, what caught our attention was two specific barriers. Uh, on the one hand, the lack of understanding of what it is that you should report. As we were mentioning before, you shouldn't only report a corruption incident, something that has happened, but also corruption risk. So something that could happen, you should still speak up about it because then that's when we're able to detect it. That's when we're able to manage it and, and address it. Uh, so on the one hand, we wanted to work on this lack of understanding of what is a risk, but we also wanted to address the lack of good examples from leaders and explore the question of, well, if leaders behaved differently and they set the right example, would that drive a higher reporting of corruption risks? So this was the context of the experiment. And now Herrieta will walk us through how we designed the experiment, what was our research design, and what are some of the findings that we uncovered. 
Over to thank you, Marietta. Thank you so much, Francesca. I hope you can hear me properly. Um, so as Francesca said, um, so we had two of these barriers that we then ended up uh, focusing on. Um, uh, there was the understanding of a risk and the uh, excellent exemplary leadership or the lack of it. And so in order to test two intervention, interventions that targeted these two uh, barriers, we conducted a randomized vignette experiments, experiment to increase risk communication in the public administration by targeting the two, um, two of these barriers. And so in this trial, uh, the population was randomized into three groups, uh, where one group received an, uh, no intervention and two, uh, groups, two treatment groups received an intervention. And our hypothesis then was that those who had received an intervention would be more likely to communicate risks as illustrated by this image. And this setup then allowed us to compare the effects of the interventions to a situation where no intervention was received. And this is then essentially where we moved to the intervention stage in the basic framework that Francesca just presented. And I will get back to the strategy uh, stage uh, in a bit. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, is there the trial design? Yes, please, thank you. Um, so here is the trial design. Uh, so in the first two steps, uh, the sample for this experiment was obtained from the population, which was all the people working in the line ministries and the central authorities. Uh, so we sent an email with a survey uh, or with a link to the survey uh, to the potential participants. And in the survey, the respondents were shown a vignette. Uh, so a short description of a hypothetical situation uh, where ideally a risk should be reported. And after this, the participants in the two treatment groups were shown the interventions. And in the last step, then uh, we asked the same questions from all the participants, which then allowed us to measure the effects of the two interventions, uh, among others, on the likelihood of communicating a risk and on various secondary outcomes, such as feeling of safety. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so here is the vignette. Uh, so you are a civil servant and your institution is regularly hiring new public officials. And you heard that public officials with a personal relationship with senior managers may have been hired in the past. And you suspect that there is a lack of control measures in hiring procedures to mitigate risks of conflict of interest and risks related to a lack of transparency. And so ideally this risk should be reported. And um, next slide, please. And these are then the two treatments. Um, so here, uh, the first one aimed at increasing risk communication through improving the understanding of a risk by giving an example of a risk from the context of health. So if you remember, one of the behavioral barriers was the understanding the lack of uh, understanding of a risk. So um, this is how we targeted it. So uh, the message was uh, being honest and speaking with your doctor about risk factors such as smoking can help you diagnose cancer in time. And similarly, every civil servant should be honest and speak about corruption risks such as the conflict, such as conflicts of interest in hiring public officials. And it is important that you communicate risks in order to minimize corruption risks in your organization. And so, yeah, here we hope to make risks easier to grasp. And then in the second message, uh, that aim to increase uh, risk communication through appealing to exemplary leader, leadership, which was the other barrier. Uh, and the message was, imagine your manager leads by example. Uh, you have seen them raise hiring risks with your executives and they encourage you and your colleagues to do the same. Uh, every civil servant should be honest and speak about corruption risks, such as conflicts of interest in hiring public officials. And it is important that you communicate risks in order to minimize corruption risks in your organization. And you might have noticed that the last uh, two last messages were the same. And so both of these messages aimed or also applied injunctive social norms by reminding that every civil servant should be honest 
and speak about risks. Uh, next slide, please. And so often there is quite high attrition when doing survey experiments, uh, which means that people do not participate in surveys or they do not fill in the whole survey. And this means that we cannot use their responses in our analysis. Um, so in order to encourage people to particip participate, we were able to conduct a lottery. Um, so if you filled in the experiment, you took part in a lottery where in total three people were selected and given the chance to have a 15 minutes chat with the prime minister at the time. And it was fun to see that the project was recognized on the highest level of public administration. Uh, next slide, please. And so here's a bit of descriptive statistics of the, the sample that we attained. So in total, we had 2,537 uh, respondents in the survey, and we had approximately the same amount of people in all the treatment and control groups as can be seen from the first line in the table. And so in the graph, in the upper graph, uh, that is an age distribution of those who responded uh, to the survey. So the distribution is approximately normally distributed. However, you can see that we have these peaks around tens, which means that people probably gave appro approximations of their uh, ages uh, in the survey. And then below we have the distribution of years in the public administration. And here again, we can see that people gave approximations of tens and fives of how long they had worked uh, in the public administration. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> but yeah, so I will now start to move on to the results. Uh, so we used various methodologies to test the effects of the interventions, such as uh, re regression analysis and means tests, uh, which are all included in the report. Uh, but here for the main results, I will present the results that we attained from the, the means tests only. Uh, next slide, please. So the likelihood of communicative risks in the control group, uh, so when no intervention was received, uh, was 48% which is an essentially a smaller chance than, than random. Um, next slide, please. And here we had the, the two interventions. So I would like to remind you of the two messages, which were the understanding for risk and the exemplary leadership uh, treatments. Um, and next slide, please. And so before we move forward, I would just like to prompt you with a quick question. Uh, so which message do you think uh, had the most significant impact on increasing willingness to communicate on corruption risks? We could do a raise of hand in the room, perhaps. So <laughs> that would be raise fun. your hand if you think the leadership was most impactful. Okay. Raise your hand if you think the understanding of a risk was more impactful. <laughs> All right, I I think um, we have people <laughs> online. Okay, great, 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 great. A few ones thinking that understanding of a risk was was important. So yeah, we're great. All right, <laughs> see that. But Herieta, let us know what happened. Yeah. All right. Let's see. So out of a sample of two thousand five hundred participants, um, oh yeah, the next slide, please. Thank you. So out of a sample of over two thousand five hundred participants from line ministries and central authorities, less than half of respondents would communicate risks. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and employees who saw the leadership message were approximately 14 percentage points more likely to communicate a risk compared to the respondents in the control group. So this was the most impactful message of the two. And on the other hand, employees who saw the understanding of risks message were approximately nine percentage points more likely to communicate a risk uh, compared to the control group. Um, but yeah, in general, in practice, uh, this experiment empirically proved that uh, behavioral insights uh, could increase integrity among uh, public officials. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, sorry, next one. <laughs> I probably hopped over that one, sorry. Um, and so in addition, we also found that younger respondents were more likely to communicate a corruption risk. Um, so the older the respondents, the less likely they are to communicate a risk. And an increase in age by one year seemed to decrease the likelihood to communicate an integrity risk by 
0.23 percentage points. And on the other hand, career length in the public administration was not found to correlate with the likelihood to communicate a risk. Um, next slide, please. Um, could we also get the, the text uh, beside the... Thank you. Um, so we also looked at the effects of the treatments on feeling of, sa of safety. Um, so after having asked the respondents for the first time how safe they would feel communicating a corruption risk, they were also asked to whom they would like to communicate a risk to. And so the answer alternatives were an anti-corruption coordinator, human resources, their manager or other, so someone else. Um, and people reported feeling generally safer once they were asked, who would you like to raise this, ri uh, this risk with? And the two treatments do at least to some extent increase the feeling of safety among the respondents, uh, but the effect sizes are small, so around three percentage points. And next slide, please. And to continue with the results and feeling of safety, uh, so those who preferred to communicate a risk to a manager um, felt significantly safest when communicating on risks. And the majority also indicated preferring to communicate a risk to their manager, uh, indicating that it is also the most common option uh, among the respondents. And then uh, senior, uh, I think we're one slide ahead actually, but um, sorry, thank you. Um, and so senior respondents were less likely to feel safe while communicating a risk after having asked whom they prefer communicating a risk to. Uh, so now, uh, if we could move to the trust slide, please. And yeah, so we also looked at trusts or the appropriateness of a risk management system as one of the outcome variables. And the appropriateness of a risk management system was not correlated with the two treatments. And based on the graph, those who would prefer to communicate a risk to a manager seem to feel the safest when communicating on risks. And Trust and understanding of risks correlated with the feeling of safety and likelihood to communicate. So people who trust the risk management system were more likely to feel safe and communicate corruption risks. And next slide, please. And so we also looked at other secondary outcome variables. One of them was the understanding of a risk. And um, so the question was, would you communicate the situation as a corruption risk, a corruption incident, or I would not communicate on this, or I do not know. And since the situation in the vignette constitutes a risk, the question only had one correct answer alternative. And on average, 30.8% of the respondents correctly indicated that the situation in the vignette is uh, or constitutes a risk. And the percent percentages for correctly indicating that, um, that the situation is constitutes a risk is similar across the treatments, so the difference across the treatment groups was insignificant, and neither of the treatments seemed to improve the understanding of a risk among the respondents. I believe that was the last slide for me. Uh, thank you so much for listening, and I would now like to hand back the floor to Francesca. Thank you so much. Thank you, Harrieta, for walking us through the findings. And I want to now present what do we make of these findings and what do we recommend to Slovakia based on this experiment. And it's always important for us to take the results of our empirical world, world uh, one step further to look into, OK, how do we turn this into a policy? And we know that Slovakia is currently working on formulating their new national anti-corruption strategy for 2024-2029. And so it's a key moment for us to input and inform the direction of, of the new strategy. And we see three main key axes of work for Slovakia on the basis of our findings. So of course, as Henrietta was saying, it's very promising that the behavioral strategies did work in improving the rates of um, communications about corruption risks. So we were very happy to see that. And what do we learn? Well, the first takeaway, uh, and, and well done to those of you that raised their hands for the leadership treatment as the most effective. Well, we do see that when leaders set the example, uh, employees follow this example. And so we think it's 
really important to empower leaders to set the standard through their actions. And the way we see to do that is to also provide trainings for them such that they're equipped with the knowledge, the skills, the resources to really lead by example, act with, the, with integrity themselves, such that the people that they manage can act with integrity as well. And at the same time, we see anti-corruption coordinators as having a key role as well in, in setting the example. And we do think that it would be great to have across agencies working across ministries on this topic and working together to redefine and develop the guidelines for the code of conduct related to this matter. The second axis that we see is that it's really important to make the risk communication process easy and well understood to ensure that employees know what they should do and how they should do it. One key finding that Henrietta just highlighted is that also people have preferences about who to report the corruption risk to. So we see that they have a preference, for example, speaking up to their managers rather than, rather than HR, for example. And this is a key finding and we should design the policies such that they go with the grain of how people behave. So if their preference is to speak up with their managers, we should make sure they feel safe to do that and they know that that is absolutely an option. And at the same time, we also need to raise awareness of the existing channels for reporting risks. We were mentioning before the electronic surveys that exist, but also other avenues for people to speak up. And so we really recommend the implementation of, of clear and concise guidelines, perhaps behaviorally informed in the way they are presented and, and make sure they are simple and easy to understand for everyone. And we really recommend implementing such guidelines to make sure everyone is in the know when it comes to how should you report a corruption risk when you see one? At the same time, the third axis uh, that we really found important, both in the diagnosis part, but also when we look at the experimental findings, is that feelings of safety really are a key enabler of people speaking up. So we have to make sure that we cultivate this culture and we make it a social norm. And we have here today with us a few experts on social norms. So I'm really excited to discuss with all of them about how do these findings connect with the behavioral literature and, and what stands out about these study that maybe resonates with other studies or maybe is different from other studies. And so for that, let me introduce our panel discussants today. I am very, very happy to welcome and introduce to you uh, Paulus Yamin, who is Scientific Director of the Institut d'études avancées de Paris. We're very happy to have Enrique Fatas, who is Professor of Economics at the European University in Spain and Director of the Behavioral Economics Institute. And may I add also a former professor at the Master of Behavioral and Decision Sciences at Penn, where we first crossed path a few years ago and uh, Professor Andrea Martinangeli, who's Associate Professor at the Burgundy School of Business. So we would like to hear from the three of you, your thoughts and comments about this study, how it connects to the literature and how you think it can help not only Slovakia, but also other countries in their uh, efforts for anti-corruption. So Enrique, we will start with you, if you wanna walk us through some of your comments on this study. Thank you very much, uh, Francesca and Chiara, uh, for this very nice invitation. Uh, so let me start uh, saying that this is a, this is a great uh, uh, project, and um, I am uh, really pleased uh, 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 to see how this uh, collaboration between the OECD and Slovakia uh, um, uh, produced uh, these uh, interesting results. How is this? Um, um, project uh, related to what we know about um, um, policies uh, uh, targeting the integrity, public integrity. Well, I believe that this is a part of a very strong trend in public policy these days. Um, and the, the, the trend uh, is just trying to, to understand how to design better policies to change uh, behavior in an effective uh, manner. And this is what this project uh, does. Changing behavior in this uh, setting or in this domain is uh, really a challenge. We are talking about a uh, very serious policy issue, public integrity. We are talking about corruption. 
And um, we are talking about a, a, a challenge here because if we want to change uh, behavior in this uh, domain, we need to keep in mind that we are talking about a very sensitive uh, 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 behavior. We are not talking about choosing A versus B when going to the supermarket. We are, we are talking about taking some actions with very serious, that may have very serious uh, consequences. Uh, so in order to change uh, behavior, what we need to do is to be very rigorous with uh, the way we identify behavioral barriers, we target a certain uh, behavior, and we run a, a, a diagnose, we diagnose uh, these uh, behavioral uh, factors. And I believe this is what the project uh, does. Starting with uh, the sensitivity of uh, public integrity or how sensitive uh, corruption uh, is, I believe what the project does uh, very well, and I believe this is also part of this uh, trend in uh, public policy, uh, is uh, to use the right uh, uh, tool. In this case, they are using a vignette. So rather than uh, simply asking people, what do you do in your agencies, in your office on a daily basis? Do you engage in uh, corruption? Well, maybe not surprisingly, the answer there would most likely be, of course not, uh, boss. Uh, well, what they do is to use a vignette and what they do is to randomly assign participants in the study to different conditions. So they are not particularly interested in asking all of them, how do you behave in uh, your daily uh, work life or professional life? They are interested in looking at differences between the different treatments to establish a causal connection between treatments and outcomes. And because the assignment is random, they can tell that if any behavior change or any difference, any treatment effect is observed between conditions, it must be associated with the differences between these conditions and not to any other uh, relevant sociodemographic uh, 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 characteristics of uh, uh, civil servants. And I believe this is uh, truly essential in any, in any uh, design of uh, public policy uh, inspired by, by um, behavioral sciences. And I believe the vignette is a very uh, valid uh, tool, particularly in this uh, 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 domain. Now, what the, what the vignette does is uh, uh, something that truly um, uh, interesting that is not only to establish causality between uh, conditions or different settings and behavior, it serves as a, as a, a wind tunnel. A wind tunnel of what? Of different policies. And this is what the vignette does, the experimentation uh, does, testing uh, things, testing different interventions and see which one works uh, uh, better. So what the project does is with the right tools, um, um, in making sure that the what we call in behavioral science, the social desirability bias, uh, pushing people to just give the response that they, they believe is expected uh, from them, they test uh, different interventions. And I believe this is a very good example of how far behavioral interventions can go, because I believe the relevant, uh, the relevant thing here is not whether or not the results are, treatment effects are uh, significantly different, it's about the magnitude of the effects. Just changing a few words, how many, maybe 10, 12, from the control to the other conditions, we get a jump from 48% to 62% of civil, civil servants, uh, uh, on average, if I remember well, willing uh, to report uh, uh, the risk. And it is not because in the control treatment, they do not identify that the risk exists. It is that the change in the conditions makes them do something different, makes them to change the way they behave and increase the likelihood of uh, reporting uh, the risk. That is behavioral public policy at work. Just by changing the setting, changing the information that is provided to civil servants, we can get, in principle, as suggested by this uh, project, uh, large, significant uh, results. Now, what I believe this uh, um, um, project uh, does is, as I said, uh, uh, to design 
uh, interventions in a very, uh, or to test the interventions in a very um, a cost effective uh, a manner. I, I, I would like to make one comment or two, if I may, about how the intervention was uh, a plan and carried out because I, I, I believe I'm going to make only two short comments and I will stop talking, I promise. So um, one comment goes in the direction of uh, beliefs. So I went through the report and maybe I missed that part, but to me, it seems quite uh, crucial to understand not only how um, uh, civil servants react uh, to different pieces of information in the vignette and actually how different uh, civil servants by age or by seniority um, uh, react uh, to the different uh, uh, conditions, but also see how they perceive uh, their environment in the in the in their agencies and uh, department. And actually, the main the main result in this intervention is that uh, the lack of leadership is most likely uh, uh, something to blame on um, maybe the lack of well, not the lack of public integrity, but public integrity not being at the level desired by the government, by the OECD. And what I, what I mean by belief say here is that in a sense, um, leadership can be interpreted also in terms of how I perceive my leaders, what I expect uh, them uh, they will do, what I expect they will approve if I report or if I do not uh, report. And maybe it could be interesting, and I don't know if you already carried out this in the, in the survey, it would be interesting to check uh, uh, these uh, expectations of civil servants, not only about leaders, say, so, well, what are they expecting from me or what will they approve if I report or not? Also my beliefs about the other, my coworkers in, my, in the same department, but what, they, uh, will, what I expect they will do or what, they, what I expect, what I believe they will approve or they will identify as the desire. Uh, or the appropriate, uh, socially appropriate uh, behavior. And I say this because particularly your definition of trust is very interesting. You define trust as believing that the system works. This is a very interesting definition of trust because it takes me to what we call in behavioral sciences, group efficacy. Do we believe we, we, we can change uh, things? But it is a belief. We are not uh, uh, collecting here information on uh, whether or not civil servants uh, have the ability or the capacity to change uh, things. We are actually inferring or eliciting their beliefs about their power to become uh, a, a actors of change in their organizations and uh, departments. So th that's my, my comment that maybe it, it could be interesting uh, to consider, uh, or maybe you did uh, collect this information uh, about uh, the expectations they had about leaders and uh, non-leaders. Uh, and then the only the only other comment I have is that uh, you mentioned scaling up and maybe how this uh, may um, inform other uh, interventions. Sadly, in behavioral science, one lesson we have learned over time is that any 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 policy must be tested again and again uh, before we scale up. And uh, I believe you made a, a brilliant uh, point on uh, on this. Uh, we always need to test and collect data before we scale up, and this is actually part uh, part of your basic uh, 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 framework. And I would like uh, to know a little bit if uh, that's uh, possible today. Um, where are we uh, here? Are we in the process of maybe uh, going further, moving from the small samples in 22 agencies to uh, uh, something bigger? Because I, I believe the list of recommendations is brilliant. But it is a very ambitious list of recommendations. And uh, landing this uh, plane into a real policy, as you know very well, uh, is uh, many times uh, complicated. So I'm going to leave it there. Congratulations for this brilliant uh, piece of uh, uh, work. Um, and uh, thank you again for uh, uh, having me. And if you have comments now or later, I would like them, uh, uh, to hear. Thank you so much, Enrique. This was very, very interesting to hear. I It caught my attention when you said that this is really atypical in the sense that it's a sensitive problem, a wicked problem that we're looking at. And so many of our applied behavioral insights project that we see are sometimes on topics such as environmental behavior or eating healthy, exercising more, where we would all agree of the, you know, 
the kind of uncontroversial nature of the desire we want to achieve versus here when we deal with anti-corruption, it's a very delicate topic by definition. And so in these, it really stands out in this way. Um, I know Chiara will have thoughts on peer beliefs. I know this is something that came up in the interview, so I'm going to let her comment in a second. And perhaps on scaling up, I would invite also Laura to, to comment on how the recommendations fit with the broader recommendations that we're providing to Slovakia, right? So when we think about this project, we also think about the larger picture in which it is embedded. Um, so maybe over to Chiara if you want to comment on peer beliefs, and then to Laura if you want to comment on broader recommendations for Slovakia. Just checking that you can hear me. This one does oh, perfect. It works. Great. So thank you so much, Enrique. Wonderful comments. And thank you so much for re-explaining the, the results so well. Um, we thought about this. Um, and so it would have been great to have an additional secondary questions. So we thought about having two outcome measures, one about what would you do in this case? And what do you think your colleagues would do in this case? And um, for the sake of brevity, uh, we decided not to, uh, but I agree that would have been particularly interesting to ask about peers and leaders as well. What we ended up ended up with was with a proxy measure of trust in the system uh, to capture um, these in, 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 in our regressions to see if trust in the system would capture some of the variance that we see in the data. But this is definitely for our next um, experiment. In terms of scale up, I think this is the next frontier. Uh, so we said plenty of good things about this report, but uh, of course, what we would like to do in the future is to test this in the real world and see do real experiments in multiple public administrations. To give an example, an, an idea in terms of scaling up could be two different things. We have 20 different public administration. We could allocate 10 public administration receiving um, access to a particular channel to report risks and 10 others having access to another channel and see in reality if we find any differences. Equally, in terms of training, uh, training is always great, but we need to test if effectively there's any change and impact on real behavior. So we'll be very keen as well to have uh, large scale experiments on the impact of any training on leaders and and employees uh, to see if it actually changes behavior. So uh, definitely we would love to do that in the future. But over to Laura to comment on scale up. Thank you. Yes, in terms of uh, broader recommendations to the Slovak Republic, as I as I said at the outset, this experiment very much fitted into this broader project um, of, of working with Slovak institutions to um, strengthen public integrity uh, across the public administration. Um, and that included uh, in the area of corruption risk management. And so we think from this perspective, it will be very interesting to see how the Slovak Republic takes this forward, especially as it is looking into designing uh, a new uh, anti-corruption strategy that will provide the, the framework uh, for efforts in the area of corruption risk management and others. And as such, we have um, also looked at this issue of strengthening corruption risk management, of course, also from several angles. And I think it's quite interesting how these behavioral findings fit in there, because there is the behavioral angle to all of this. And, and as you mentioned, it probably merits some more testing and will require further work also um, if this is taken forward on, on the side of, of Slovak institutions. But there are a number of other things that we also found that, that could be done. For instance, we have been working with uh, the institutions to simplify the survey that was mentioned to make it easier uh, for um, public officials to use this tool. Um, we have also provided a number of recommendations, for instance, that go towards simplifying the methodological guidance um, around corruption risk management. And I think all of these different bits and pieces, hopefully, um, if they're taken forward, will, um, will help um, in, in strengthening uh, corruption risk management practice. Thank you so much. We're also very curious to hear from Paulius about your thoughts yeah. and comments on the study and which features of this study stood out to you the most. All right. Thank you very much for the invitation. I Yes, I have a few 
points, but I, I also can help to to comment a little bit on on um, what I was thinking while hearing the presentation, because 10 years ago, I was um, a public servant working on these topics as well in the Colombian government, and we were tasked with um, uh, creating the integrity codes for the public servants, uh, which was one of the requirements for Colombia to get into the OECD. Um, and I, I couldn't help to to remember how how far we've come in in these topics. Um, at that time, of course, there were some some things, but um, when you look at what you did in this report, which is a great example of of how behavioral um, approaches and methodologies can support policy making, um, it's amazing. So I I. Um, just wanted to go quickly through a few of them. So when, when you are a public servant trying to, to solve these topics, I think one of the first things you, you face um, is the complexity. And uh, improving integrity can be anything and nothing. Um, so the fact of um, identifying concrete behaviors you want people to do and that hopefully uh, will uh, promote a better ethical management and better control and better uh, culture of integrity is already um, a huge tool, that a huge value added that the behavioral approach um, gives because many interventions don't have that. We, we try to improve integrity in general uh, and we do things we believe will help, but um, having this focus is already a huge value added. Then there's of course the the understanding of the of the behaviors and why they happen. Um, this is also a huge crucial thing because if we don't know what people believe, um, how can we change their beliefs or what beliefs we should change among the thousands of things that could be playing. Um, so these methodologies give you uh, also concrete lines of actions to address that. Then there is the design of the of the intervention, which is something I'm particularly interested in in the in the fields of social norms. Um, and usually, as Enrique said already, um, these uh, behavioral interventions are are amazing because they leverage very simple, pieces of information. It's it's a couple of sentences that are different. Um, the trick is um, to rigorously test and design them so that we know that this sentence produces nine, this sentence uh, 14, and so we should go with this sentence among, again, the millions of sentences that, that we could inv invent. Um, and trying to do a, a careful balance between um, the evidence that there is, the impact you think you can achieve, and also the, the resources, the, which, yeah, the political um, uh, environment, the operational things, and the financial, of course. And then the last one is the evaluation. Um, we rarely also in, in such uh, initiatives have uh, the level of insight that this provides for, for next steps in which you know there is uh, a couple of things that will work and you know that one is more useful than the other and you know where to go. Um, that's also very rare. And then um, I focused my, my comments a little bit on the on possibilities for the, for the scale up. Um, a few areas and experiences uh, seem interesting to me to to explore further for to do this. The first one is in terms of social norm interventions. Um, a, a few years ago, we did a, a systematic study of almost a hundred in social norm interventions with some colleagues from LSE, um, and we were trying to analyze a little bit the techniques the behavioral change techniques, which is the actual action you use to change the behavior. Is it a full workshop? Is it a poster with a certain message? And what does the message contain and so on? Um, and this shows very interesting um, options. 
uh, in, in that framework, we described a little bit some other ways that this could be expanded at and complemented using the same um, sentences or, or elements that were leveraged here. Um, just for people to have an idea, a couple of the things we saw is a difference between the interventions that um, intervene where people are making the decision at the same time in the same context and those that are given away from the context in a training, uh, at home, whatever. Um, there's also uh, a topic in the social norm literature about the information you get about what others are doing and what others consider acceptable. You can get it either as a summary of what the group is doing. So 90% of people believe this and that, or you can get it as, um, as uh, a little bit like here as an exposure to behavior and opinions. Um, so you get exposed to what others are doing, relevant others and what others think, and then you change your own um, um, perception. And then the third is, is um, the inclusion of different intervention elements um, in terms of uh, psychological, social and physical levers. Um, here you have a few. Um, but there's a big list of things that can be used. I don't think there's evidence on, on what works better in these things in, in general. Uh, there are particular cases that have worked well uh, for some things, uh, but having the, the broadness and, and expanding from here could be, could be valuable. And uh, the other one is, it, it was interesting to me how this is, uh, which maybe you saw because it's very similar. It, it's similar a little bit to the, um, to the literature on, on uh, speaking up for uh, safety dangers, uh, which I know a little bit because a colleague at the LSE works on that. And it was interesting for me to see that there as well, they speak about uh, around a 50% uh, rate of people that report uh, the risks when they are happening. And there it's uh, like um, situations where people could get physically hurt. Um, so it's much more concrete, much more tangible. They do research on uh, airline pilots, train pilots and so on. And apparently only half of the people speak up even when they could get physically hurt, which is interesting. Um, and they, they simplifying a little bit, they find some similar things to you. Um, it's really important that people know how to do it, uh, that they know that some, something will happen when they speak up. So the trust part we were discussing in the system and the social norms uh, from peers and, and uh, bosses. Um, and lastly, um, maybe a, an interesting line um, to explore as well is some of the work that was done in, in Colombia um, for, for um, civic culture around um, uh, people reporting crimes, um, where they worked a lot on changing the social status of the people that speak up uh, which in Colombia has a very um, um, like derogative term for the people that that speak up, and you can imagine this for from the um, uh, context of violence and so on. But what they focus on was to transform the the same word, but now it's not negative; it's positive. It's something that someone that helps the the collective that helps keep us safe and so on. Um, and this was done in part um, uh, engaging relevant actors and celebrities and so on, changing the negative for the positive, but also uh, giving people safe ways of regulating each other, um, which is something that's uh, very interesting to me because, yeah, you often see others doing something you don't agree with, but uh, you don't speak up, you don't tell, you, you keep silent. It seems that when you give people a safe and and a slightly humorous way, as they have done in Colombia, to regulate each other, it works very well um, to decrease rates because you don't need an external person that that enforces the rules. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit there.
Thank you so much, Paulius. I really like your suggestions for, for scaling up and the realization that this experiment we did is one of many possible angles to explore the, the topic of public integrity. And it's true that there are so many other angles that we could explore that other countries could also look into. So I think this is the, that, that is very important to highlight. And I also liked the, the way you worded it, that it's that this experiment gives us concrete lines of action. It's true and it's what we hope to have achieved through the experiment. So thank you so much for this. Uh, I also wanted to turn to Andrea. Andrea, you have been one of the first pair of eyes to look at this report, serving as one of our early reviewers. So very curious to hear your thoughts as well on how the project has developed and, and the recommendations from it. Thank you very much, Francesca. And thank you, um, uh, well, everyone here uh, for, uh, for the invitation. Uh, I wish to also thank Enrique, Enrique and uh, Paulius for uh, for their comments. Uh, yes, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I've had the privilege of uh, having eyes on the on the reports. Well, almost a year ago now, um, when it was in the uh, data analysis stage, uh, and I've seen well, I've seen the early the early version, and uh, now seeing the the full fledged uh, report is actually quite uh, touching. I would say. And my impression, the one, the impression that I had back then, and and that I keep on having is that this is this is indeed a very ambitious study. Um, it is ambition be ambitious because because the uh, the topic is extremely difficult to study, especially when we are targeting the relevant population at hand. Right, we're not tar targeting a random sample of the population. We're not targeting students, uh, as in laboratory experiments. We're actually targeting the people who need to do their job. In, in reporting corruption risks at potentially a very high personal cost, or at least perceived high personal cost. Um, and one of the, the things that stood out, so for, first of all, um, is the use of analogies that you uh, implemented, because I think that's crucial in, uh, in allowing people to understand what we're talking about, okay? Um, and perhaps an intervention that could be tested in the future is one in which, yes, you explain risk and you actually tell them, tell people, okay, with posters, what would you do if you suspected that you had some disease? Well, you rush to the doctor. And that's exa exactly what the servant, civil servants should do in reporting risks uh, in terms of uh, corruption. Um, now, clearly that will, will depend on the social context and how people understand the norms and the behaviors that are prevalent in uh, in the in their work environment but what seems to be the case transpiring from the data is that people really want to report people really want to take action because as soon as you give them something it, it respective of what you give them i think this is something that Enrique already um, touched upon as soon as you give them something a cue allowing them to do so they do so and you have these very big effects, which are which are impressive, given the 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 small sample size that you have. Uh, and then the question becomes exactly what is blocking them? What is preventing them from um, materially speaking up? Uh, which could be uh, anything from fear of retaliation, thinking that okay, this is not how we do things. Okay. Um, then figuring out how to enable them, designing an institution which uh, allows them to do so, feeling safe on one side and think that safety is, as has been said already here, uh, safety is key um, in order to allow people to uh, to safely contribute to the public good, which is, you know, integrity. Um, reporting is indeed an act of uh, contributing to a collective good at own, uh, possibly on uh, uh, high own personal costs. Um, for the follow-up, I think one of the challenges, especially I'm latching on to what was said earlier in terms of testing in different uh, offices of the public administration, different treatments, let's say, um, the challenge there that should be kept in mind is that of uh, potentially very strong spillovers because people will talk. Uh, if I know, if I'm working in public office, public administra administration office number one, and I know someone in public administration office number two, and we're having a coffee, and uh, I mention, 
some intervention or some email that I receive, and then the person is connecting, oh, I also received something different, but slightly different, uh, something similar, but slightly different. Uh, that might actually, um, well, that, that is, a, is an added uh, complication to the, uh, to the, to the follow-up, uh, which should be uh, kept well in mind. Um, and I want to touch upon the, uh, what emerges, the, uh, the role of leadership because leadership is, uh, as I view it, something that can be extremely positive and powerful, but also extremely negative, extremely risky. Um, several times in the in the report, there's uh, this mention, this reference to the tick in the box, and that tick in the box is not just something that, um, well, prevents from information information from flowing where it needs to flow. It is actually having a negative impact on the rest of the well, office on the employees for the very simple fact that it's draining power. Uh, I can even tell my manager that uh, there is a risk of corruption somewhere, but if that person is just going to tick the box and not do anything else, uh, it's as good as if I don't do it. Or uh, they know that they're ticking the box. If I actually give positive feedback, that might just go into the bucket of, well, the bucket is, the bucket is ticked, I, I don't need to, uh, I mean, there's nothing good coming out of this. Um, so there's, uh, this is how I see it. It's a, it's a very good first study on the field, which opens up for an amazing amount of uh, potential follow-ups, which I really hope to see uh, coming up in the, in the next few years, because this is really what we need in our societies nowadays. Uh, studies that tackle the the problem directly with uh, uh, like let's say uh, shining a light directly on the population that is interesting and that needs to uh, um, be uh, understood and that's it for me thank you so much these are very interesting insights as well i i think it's very true this is an ambitious study and and it's great to see the impressive results and the also the statistical magnitude of it. I think this is something Enrique also highlighted earlier that we don't just see that behavioral insights work, but we see the magnitude with which they work um, in the constraint of the sample size that we have. So 2,500 um, public officials and, and three treatments. So, I mean, it's, it's impressive that we were able to, to see such an impact. Um, now we would like to open the floor to Q and A's both online and in the room. So please feel free to raise your virtual hand or physical hand if you have any comments that you would like to ask our panel of experts or ourselves. I see one hand raised uh, online from Georgios. So if you want to speak up, the, the floor is yours. Sure, thank you so much, Francesca. Hi, my name is George Saitis. I work in strategic foresight. Uh, so thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, the findings were like really thought provoking um, and the discussion with the experts. So um, I would like to come back to the results of the experiment uh, because we saw that the leadership message uh, intervention was most impactful for communicating corruption risks. Uh, but what was very interesting, it was also that uh, the younger participants uh, were more likely uh, to communicate the risk the risk of corruption than older uh, respondents. And at first glance, um, maybe someone would you know, expect uh, that uh, the older people uh, would be more comfortable uh, to uh, communicate uh, this type of risks uh, to their managers, especially you know, uh, given that they have a close relationship with them or they feel like they have like a, a bigger career confidence. But however, we saw that younger participants uh, were more likely to speak up so I would like to ask the floor, uh, everyone who was uh, involved in the experiment, uh, why do you think that is? Uh, and do you think that, for example, uh, one explanation could be that younger employees maybe tend to value their reputation more? And as a result, maybe they view the, the act of communicating these types of risks to their managers as a way to build better reputation and maybe gain some long-term benefits, such for example, wanting to ensure their position or wanting to um, uh, upgrade their current career status. 
Or maybe is it uh, that they view their managers as being uh, more uh, trustworthy? It would be really interesting to see if you have any potential experiences for this. Thanks. Thank you, Hofkos. This is a great question. And it allows us to go a little bit more in depth on this finding, which is true. It's a very interesting one that younger people were more likely to report risks than more senior people. And we think this is because of two reasons. So on the one hand, there is, we believe, a greater fear of retaliation from more senior people. So the fact of them being in more senior positions also means that their reputational risk is greater. And the second reason is status quo bias. So having been in the administration for a longer period of time, we think could be a reason why they don't really have an incentive to change things, to speak up about things. And perhaps they've seen similar behaviors over and over again throughout their careers. So we think overall these two reasons, so a greater fear of retaliation and a greater status quo bias could be motivating why we see this age effect. But I'm also interested to hear from our experts whether this is something you see in the literature more bro broadly. Is there an impact of age on integrity? What do we know about this? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's a very good uh, uh, point. Um, I was not surprised by that uh, result. In a sense, it was uh, pretty consistent with what we have seen in other uh, in other domains. And to me, the first uh, um, possibility was uh, something you just mentioned, Francesca. I would call it the opportunity cost. What is the opportunity cost of a senior uh, a civil servant to report, maybe higher because they fear retaliation, or maybe because um, they fear that uh, they are going to get in the in the wrong position. Uh, he or she will be perceived as the rat in the department. Um, that's one possibility. Another possibility that connects uh, with beliefs is that uh, senior uh, civil servants have already been exposed to corruption or bad practices, and if they have been. Maybe their beliefs about what is right and what is wrong and how useful uh, reporting will be are totally different from uh, the beliefs uh, held by uh, junior uh, civil servants. They have never seen, seen it. They have not been exposed. And this is something that uh, is a, another possibility that may explain this interesting, interesting result. Yeah, Andy? Yes, I, I want to add to this the fact that Perhaps there is also a greater exposure of uh, younger generations to uh, broader communication about what is good and what is wrong. Um, and so a younger uh, employee might feel more entitled to uh, uh, rightfulness, to uh, integrity than an older uh, than an older generation employee, simply because of the social con the social cultural context, which is different across generations. That's it. Thank you so much. Chiara, any comments from you on this point or more generally um, the report? These are very good comments. I think in general, there's evidence not specifically in anti-corruption policies, but more in general about risk aversion evolving over time. So to be honest, we were expecting also a difference um, according to gender in likelihood to report. We didn't find that, but the effect of age was very strong and all these reasons are plausible, for surely. Um, I don't know if there are other uh, questions online. I see Maros. Yeah, Maros, over to you. Yeah, just a small comment that the uh, uh, divide between younger and older generations is consistent with our data in a civil service council. Uh, we do yearly reports and we focus on different facets of behavior. And we found out that the uh, motivation, but also I would say the positive view of things goes a little bit the, the more you are in the civil service. So perhaps this reflects it. And I would also go, but this is my guess, with the social, uh, like uh, like what is normal for the older generations, because we are also an ethical body. And I see sometimes the gap that what was ethical 20 years ago with regards to benefits, gifts, or 30 years ago, it's becoming unethical now. So this is my comment to it. Thank you.
That's an excellent point about ethics changing over time and a very fascinating one. I know Laura had a little comment as well. Not on this point, though. Um, I just wanted to come back very briefly to what Andrea said earlier about uh, leadership and ticking the box and what happens if, well, uh, an employee reports a risk, but then a, a manager doesn't do anything about it. right? And so I just wanted to mention that, um, well, of course, in, in this experiment, we are focused on the co communication of risks and how we can incite people to uh, to do so, because it is the basis for managing corruption risks then, right? If we don't know about them, we cannot change anything and, and we cannot actually address them. Of course, um, in our work, we are looking at the whole um, at the whole corruption risk management system as such. And that of course, as a very important part has uh, the design of mitigation measures then. And I think um, this uh, again, you know, is something that, that many uh, countries struggle with. One, It, it is one thing to uh, to know about risks, to assess them, but then to design mitigation measures that that address those risks um, is is then the next step that that needs to follow. Otherwise, of course, um, there is not much point in in the whole exercise. Um, and so, this is also something that we've been working with the Slovak Republic on. Thanks. Thank you. So, I'm mindful of the clock ticking. So, one last question from Helena Kankova. The floor is yours. I see the hand is raised online. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am uh, from Slovakia. I am working for Ministry of Interior uh, of the Slovak Republic, and I was involved in uh, creation anti-corruption policy uh, in uh, our ministry. So uh, I am involved in this type of uh, uh, soft uh, policy. I am working for National Crime Agency. We are a repression body, but we also deal with uh, uh, prevention activities. Uh, and I was working also on uh, uh, integrity issue. I create some e-learning program. And uh, I have another point uh, on this e-learning program. Uh, I put there some... Uh, uh, some aspects of integrity, revolving doors, lobbying, and so on. So I was very wondering what uh, what was your project about. So I am uh, very happy that it is another approach, this approach which we need a lot in our society because it's a focus on behavior, uh, how to behave, how to aware, how to um, raise awareness in our society. So I uh, I totally like this project and I think that it is just a mirror of us how our society is what we need to improve uh, what is bad um, there was research so it was a, a, a amusing uh, amazing for me that it is uh, not just uh, uh, for thinking how it can be but there is also evidence uh, according this survey and so on. So uh, I admire this project and I am very happy that it was created for Slovak Republic. And uh, it is for us. Uh, so through uh, your recommendation, we can learn how to improve our society, uh, to increase our integrity. Uh, so it is, uh, as I mentioned, like a mirror for us. Uh, I do not have what is uh, uh, concrete in uh, recommendations. I will have some recommendation that uh, we need to improve uh, behavior uh, of our society, especially in uh, in uh, civil service. But we need uh, we need, as we, it was mentioned many times, leadership. Yes, which will lead uh, uh, some workshop and so on. Maybe we will. Uh, we need to start also with education people. So we need to start earlier, not just at work, earlier at school. So if uh, if it is not in recommendation, maybe I will recommend it uh, in the future during follow up and so on. So uh, we need to because I as I was create. Uh, was created uh, this uh, integrity program on internet e-learning program i realized that a lot of people do not understand uh, uh, what the integrity is and um, 
um, risk management and so on. So uh, we need to educate our society and we need to start at the uh, uh, universities or uh, um, a high uh, school level. Uh, and then uh, the people will know about these uh, expressions and if they started to work for civil service, they will uh, implement uh, what, what they will learn. Uh, so I think that uh, it is a really very good uh, project for us. Uh, if uh, there will be a chance, I will be participate on it. I will uh, spread these uh, um, these new things, new uh, results from uh, um, survey from this project uh, uh, because I organize uh, um, I organize uh, educational activity concerning integrity and uh, anti-corruption issue. Uh, so it it will help uh, us to um, to cultivate our society. So thank you very much. Thank you, Helena. Thank you so much for the kind words on the project. And we're so happy to hear that you are committed to spreading the word on the project and also continue advancing the work on public integrity in the Slovak public administration. So we want to end on this note of, of hope and commitment to continue working on the topic. We would like to thank you all for joining us today, both the people in the room and the people online. A very special thanks to our guest speakers, Enrique, Paulius, and Andy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the ASI colleague for the wonderful collaboration throughout the project. And of course, the biggest thank to Chiara for making it all possible and leading the way throughout. So thank you again, and we'll be in touch. Uh, in the Zoom chat, you will find a link to the full report. Make sure to download it and reach out if you have any questions. Thank you again.